Hi there, I'm Rebecca and a really warm welcome back to my channel, Pumpkin Becky. In this week's video, we're going to look at bulking up the spring garden on a bit of a budget. Let's get started. The spring garden is really starting to come alive. It's mid-March now. The violets are leafing out and also flowering. We've got hellebores of all shades from white through yellow into this deepest, darkest one that I've got just down the back here. We've got muscari, daffodils, narcissi, more hellebores, some crocuses, more muscari, primroses, tulip leaves coming up, pulmonaria, vibrant anemones, and a few clusters of iris reticulata and sprinklings of cyclamen with spring gardening it's actually really hard to gauge the density right and that's mostly because you are planting little brown things with no signs of growth and trying to gauge how that's going to look come the spring. It, it is an incredibly hard thing to do and you have to have a lot of faith in your planting and your bulbs. You also have to remember that spring is an incredibly long season. Uh, some things started actually flowering in December and they will carry on right into May so trying to have something that will stagger right through that period is again really hard to achieve and hard to achieve in a way that doesn't look spotty. Um, you go through the catalogues and you go for a bag of 50 early flowering um, daffodils on narcissi let's say uh, and then you might have another bag of 50 mid mid spring flowering and then a later season batch and by that time you've got things like the tulips coming through with their flowering but each of those bulbs is probably only going to have one flower you do get some which are multi flower and that's fantastic um, but for the most part, spring bulbs are a single flower coming from that single bulb. So in a border the size of mine, 50 bulbs actually doesn't go very far. And then when you're trying to eke that out across five months, it's incredibly hard work for these plants. That's why it's great to underplant with things like primroses and violets which will repeat flower on their own, you don't have to do anything to them and they will have lots of flower on one plant, they are perennial so they really help create a, an understory even underneath tiny little bulbs that they keep that colour and that density going for you. So if 50 bulbs doesn't go very far, it can work out quite expensive. Add to that the fact that you're, you're trying to guess how many to put in a garden. Sometimes it's actually better to wait until spring when shops and online sources have got plants that are in the green. So they've taken the bulbs, they've grown them on over winter and then you buy them either potted or bare, bare bulbed, <laughs> bare rooted um, and you plant that. That's a fantastic way to grow snowdrops. Uh, snowdrops are notoriously tricky to get to come into flower from a bulb 
but if you combine them in the green and the garden centers have them potted I buy clumps of them from Amazon and eBay they are much more reliable so it's really good cost-effective way to do it so it's now the middle of March and you know how garden centers like to throw all the spring color at you really early and probably before you're even ready to think about going in the garden and then these things start to look a little bit tired go over or they've come out into full flower and the garden centers know that people won't pay for them it's actually a really good time to get yourself to the garden center to your local DIY store and see what they've got yesterday evening I went and picked up all of these beauties for quick maths I think it was about 31 pounds I've got four large pots each have got about 12 narcissus bulbs in they're in full flower and the bonus of that is if I place that plot in my border just to check where I want to put them I can see instantly what volume they take up how much color impact they give me it takes all the guesswork out of it I've also bought some iris reticulata you see I've got four trays of six pots here and then I also bought nine primula and I'm just in love with the color of these primula and there's nothing wrong with them these are going at the moment for a pound each and remember these are a perennial plant I have got some that I've had going for five six years now you know I just put them in seasonal containers then at the when I want to change it out for the summer I dig them up I put them into another container or out into a bed and then I can dig them up again when I want to put them into another spring container <laughs> and for a pound I mean the only thing that's wrong is I've got a couple of spent flowers deadhead them more are coming there's there's so many more flower buds coming in here it's a no-brainer now a common mistake with spring bulbs is to plant them too thinly and <laughs> partly the problem there is that the packets tell you to do that if you're going to leave bulbs in to naturalize i.e. leave them in from year to year to year not dig them up and replace them then you you can afford to plant them a bit closer than they say otherwise you really don't end up with any impact at all there's an advantage as well to growing taller stemmed flowers closer together in that if there's a strong wind coming through they will help support each other one of my biggest problems with planting in this particular border is that I forget where I've put things so planting bulbs in the autumn is uh, a little bit risky I so often cut through bulbs accidentally because I'm thinking that looks like a really good spot in with the trowel and I come out with a bulb on the end of it as I've accidentally hit a pocket of plants that I've already thought that's a good spot to put some bulbs
So hopefully you can already see that adding those narcissi in three big clumps has already bulked up and brightened up the spring display. Now we're going in with the Iris Reticulata. Please don't be afraid of buying bulbs where the flowers are already spent. Next year they're going to flower again and the year after and the year after and they will have offsets and the clumps will increase. So never fear. But we still have some that are only just flowering, some that are still to flower. So there's lots that we will gain from them this year. They are not planted en masse in an easy clump for us, so we're going to need to plant these individually, but we're going to use that same technique of making a bigger hole to plant the entire clump into. So I'm choosing a spot in between where I know I have planted things before. And I'm using my root assassin because I've got big tree roots in here. Although over the 10 years that I've now been gardening in this bed, we've now built up quite a good depth of um, topsoil, loam, leaf litter. Underneath is still clay, chalk and flint and also builder's rubble. <laughs> um, so it is important to, with bulbs, they, they love drainage, so it is important to add grit underneath them. What's actually quite nice here is that this is a recyclable container and it's not pots within a tray, this is the pot itself. So that's really good, there's no unwanted wasted unrecyclable black plastic going on here. What would make me even happier would be if they made a claim as to how little peat they used in these. Um, surprisingly there is no mention about peat content and actually B&Q have been getting a lot better about uh, saying how much peat they put in their pot plants. What I have done is just go around and nip off the spent flower buds now that I've assessed the clump and how big it is and how much impact it will have. That will stop the plant putting energy into making seed when actually we want it to bulk up the bulb. And don't be worried that I'm digging up lots of important plants here. This is mostly Creeping Jenny, which is very rampant, and there are some um, violets in here as well. Again, I've got hundreds and thousands of them, so I'm not worried at all. You might notice there are lots of seed heads in and around. That's because they're a useful food source for the local bird life, and also they continue to shed seeds for this year. These again are all native plants, I think that was betony. Really good forage plants for bees. And of course you will find that the plants growing in the garden centre are earlier than if you had planted them yourself or in fact next year when they come up again. I have lots of Irish reticulata over there but they're nowhere near as advanced as these ones that I've just bought. So I really hope you can see what a difference that has made to the woodland border. Especially here, where you've got the iris reticulata, the large clumps of narcissi, it's all just helping to bulk it up.
You'll notice I've kept back a pot of the Narcissi and that's because I'm going to do another project with them. I've got here two flower pots, different sizes and a nice galvanised tin slip pot that I'm going to use. This is some of eCoco's um, pot drainage layer. Yes, pot drainage layer. So it is cocoa fibre. And I'm going to use that instead of crock in the bottom of the pot. So I've added some peat free compost to my pot. I'm just going to go through and deadhead some of these primula. And I reckon I can get three in here. Make sure you take off any dead or dying leaves as well. I've got one there. And then I'm going to quickly backfill any corners, gaps. And that's just going to sit in that slip pot like that. Cute. And just in case you didn't know, my family has a history with Covent Garden. We used to have a uh, flower stall there in the flower market. Uh, that was my great grandfather. So that bucket's got nothing to do with Covent Garden other than it's printed on it, but it makes me happy. It makes me think of our, fa our family past. I'm going again with my uh, Koya drainage layer. The unique and awesome thing about using that as opposed to something like a traditional crock is that the plants can grow into it. It is a completely friendly environment for plant roots to grow into, yet it's still maintains that open texture which means that excess fluid will just run through. I'm using a peat free compost here. For some reason this year I have struggled to actually find peat free compost. Um, it tends to be this New Horizon stuff that I'm finding. Um, it certainly looks a better texture than it has in previous years when I've bought it. But there's still there's too much peat-based compost on the market. The, sh the, the spaces for compost is just filled with general multi-purpose compost and it's peat-based. We need to just stop. Just get on the bandwagon and <laughs> stop using peat. I'm going to take some of these narcissi and use them in here but I am going to plant them with more of the primula. So just like I did before I have to carefully sort of wiggle my fingers through the plants. Up end, out they come and then I almost want to just sort of take half ish do it carefully so I can literally just drop those straight into the back of my planter using the shape of the pot that they've come out of to help me position them at the back of this pot and then I'm going to fill 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 with the primula so again, deadheading, taking off dead leaves. But first, I'd better bring the compost layer up. And 
never feel like you're wasting flowers when you've deadhead. You're not. You're encouraging new ones to come through. You're making space for them. You're giving the plant chemical signals that it needs to put out new fresh flowers. Remember to fill gaps. And then I can go ahead and plant the rest of these into the spring flower bed. So there you go, that's two bargain projects in one this week. I hope you enjoyed them. Right, that's it for this week's video. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to rate, share and subscribe to me here on YouTube. Until next time, bye.